Good evening. Appreciate you taking some time out tonight to uh, go over some risk adjustment and uh, the calculation of RAF scores. I think it's important before we start that we understand some basic terminology, and I'll be referring to this and using this abbreviation HCC, uh, which stands for Hierarchical Condition Categories, and, and that's the basis for how the risk scores are determined for uh, Part A, Part B, and C, which is Medicare Advantage. Uh, there is also an RxHCC, and this is for adjusting drug costs, and this is for Part D, and we'll go over that a little bit tonight, too. As well, uh, of course, I'll use the terminology RAF, which is your risk adjustment factor and your risk score that you'll get for the patient's uh, care. So just a brief overview of how Medicare risk adjustments work and why it's so important, especially for Medicare Advantage, which receives their payments from CMS based on risk adjustment which is used to ensure that they're getting the payments for the illness burden of the patients they're caring for. Of course, it's driven by the patient's risk score and health status and demographics, and it all gets fed into this hierarchical condition category, HCC model, that spits out a risk-adjusted score. And we're gonna look at that in a couple minutes on how that's calculated. So every patient has a risk score based on their age, sex, whether they're dual eligible, such as, uh, uh, Medicaid, Medicare, or they're disabled, um, and then they get another part of their risk score that's determined by their health status. So as to their health, I seek just heart failure, diabetes, all those things go into making up this risk score. And here you can see these are the demographic RAF for Medicare enrollees. So 65 to 69, uh, female gets a 0.312 RAF score, where a male gets a 0.30, and this increases as you get older, of course, and the health burden gets uh, worse. Higher risk scores, they do represent members with a greater than average burden of illness, but lower risk scores sometimes could indicate that the population is healthier, but it also could be a result of inadequate or incomplete chart and documentation or inadequate or in, uh, uh, complete diagnosis coding, which is critical to determining the risk score. So this is how it all comes together, uh, the HCC model. You've got the disease hierarchy, the, the diagnoses are uh, into these uh, disease groups uh, called condition categories, and then you use hierarchy logic, uh, which we'll explain in a second. There are some disease interactions, which uh, give you additional risk scores for certain diseases that are combined in the same patient and managed. All this information comes from hospital inpatient, outpatient, and physician settings. Of course, we talked about the demographic values which go into this, uh, and then it's critical to understand this is a prospective model. The diagnosis is for the base year is used, so for this year would be used for next year's payments. Each January, the member's risk score is reset for a new year of diagnosis data. So basically this all funnels down. We have now approximately 70,000 ICD-10 codes and close to 9,000 of them that map into these risk scores. They go into these 25 condition categories, which then are whittled down into these 79 HCCs, which we're going to show you in a minute. Uh, what that actually, or how those are actually set up. So these are the HCC categories. These are the first uh, 33, as you see, AIDS, HCC1, has a risk score uh, associated with 0.312. So any diagnosis that goes into for an HIV patient uh, would give them a risk score of 0.312. Uh, you can see HCC8 right here, which is metastatic cancer. It's nonspecific. The cancer can be brain, it can be liver, it can be met to the um, kidney, it can be met uh, to the uh, lungs, it can be met to anywhere. As long as there's metastatic cancer or acute leukemia, they get a risk score of 0.265. And then you see some other things here, and we're going to talk about the diabetes here in a minute because that's the most important one that most providers uh, need to understand. So some of these HCCs override others. So you saw that list there of those 33, but what you didn't see, and I'll show you in a slide coming up here, is that Certain ones, based on the lower number, uh, so 8 would be better than 9, 17 would be better than 18. Whichever one's the lowest number in these categories that go together would actually be the risk score you get because there is some overlap. And diabetes is a, a prime example of that. Diabetes with acute compl complications like hyperosmolar coma, uh, that would be an HCC 17. So that would go into category 17. Chronic complications, neuropathy, renal, eyes, things like that, those are being... Those are going to 18, and then diabetes without complications, which is your uh, E11.9 diagnosis, would go into HCC 19. 17 would have the highest uh, RAF uh, support, 
followed by 18, followed by 19. So if you had diabetes with hyperosmolar coma or something acute and it went to HCC 17, you would ignore all the other 18 and 19 level diagnoses for diabetes in that patient. If you had a di uh, patient with diabetes with just neuropathy and say they had eye issues, they had kidney issues, all from diabetes, you'd only get credit for one of them, but you'd eliminate any diagnosis you had in 19, which is the one for diabetes without complications, or E11.9. And this, again, we'll go back to that list of HCC codes. Um, I'm, I'll show you a, a slide here in a second and how this is grouped, but I put these together to show you that uh, for cancer, 8 through 12, 8 is going to trump 9, which is going to trump 10, which is going to trump 11, which is going to trump 12. So, and same thing here, 17 is going to override 18, which is going to override 19. So this shows you exactly what I just said. So if you get a diagnosis in, in 8 for metastatic cancer, no matter what other type of cancer you have, no matter what else, you're going to get the code just in, in category 8. If you have lung or some of the other severe cancers, it's going to trump the colorectal or bladder or other cancers in, in 11. Same thing with diabetes. The acute is going to trump the chronic, and then the chronic, of course, 18 is going to trump 19, which is the diabetes without complications. And down here, pay particular attention to this because we're going to come up with some examples later that uh, atherosclerosis of extremities with alteration or gangrene. 106 is going to trump 107, 108, 161, 189. So it's going to trump all four of those um, categories. Just so you understand what's going on here, because I'm going to use these examples as we go forward, you're going to see this column with override. Override means that there's a score that's higher or in the same category, so the override means they're not going to get credit for that score. In this column, I put the categories, and then, of course, we put the ICD-10s and the diagnosis. And what we'll do with these examples is basically I've thrown all these codes into one patient. Now, they may not, you know, this, again, this doesn't happen I don't know of a patient that's going to have all of these simple, all of these diagnoses, but I just wanted to show you how they're processed internally to come up with a RAF score. So we have 19 HCC, which I said is less on its, it's uh, 17 is lower on the totem pole, and so it has higher uh, affinity for getting the uh, uh, diagnosis uh, that counts for the RAF than does 18 or 19. So 17 is going to override 19. So diabetes without complications immediately gets uh, eliminated uh, because you have a diagnosis here with 17, uh, which is the diabetes with hyperosmolarity, and you get a score of 0 0.318. What you're going to see is that 17 and 18 both have the same risk scores, 0 0.318, for no matter what complication you have. It can be neuropathy, it can be uh, 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 retinal uh, proliferation, it can be drug-induced, um, it can be circular complications. All of them are going to have 0 0.318. Now, I want you to pay particular attention to this one here in red. You would think that three decimals after the uh, EO8 would get you a RAF score, but you have to be very careful in the, in the uh, diabetes of, uh, that has anything to do with retinopathy because it requires four digits, unless there's always an exception. You do the unspecified, which in this case is 0 0.311, and you see you did get a RAF, but, which doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but the to use a diagnosis like this, severe non-proliferative retinopathy with macular edema seems more specific, but because you didn't put the fourth digit in, which tells you which eye it's in, you got no RAF score. So it's very important. Anytime you use any of these uh, codes with the uh, 0.3, you definitely want to have four, uh, four decimal points uh, after the E11. This shows some more sophisticated codes with diabetes, um, E11.52. And the reason these are a little bit more sophisticated is they actually, one code, wraps the three different HCC categories. So a patient with gangrene, which is going to get a RAF score of 1.461, also gets uh, the code in 108 and the, the basic code in 18. However, as we showed you at the beginning, 106 overrides 108, so they're only going to get credit for the gangrene. So let's look at a patient without gangrene. They're going to get credit for that 108 and 18. Um, in this example, of course, it's overridden because you have the 106 there, but if you did not have the patient with gangrene in this uh, example here, you would see that the 0.298 and the 0.318 would all wrath. And, of course, all the other 0.318s are going to eliminate, and the one with 19 diabetes without complications is going to eliminate. I wanted to show you this, that there really isn't a code for diabetic 
uh, neuropathy, it's the diabetes codes, which are the E11.4s. So mono uh, neuropathy gets no RAF code. Uh, hereditary idiopathic gets no RAF code. I showed you right here, we put gangrene in just to show you that you're only going to get credit for one of those diagnoses, but it's always good to include not only the diabetes uh, code, but to also include the gangrene code, as well as atherosclerosis of the aorta, which is another uh, code that will RAF, but because you have the severity of gangrene, 106 is going to override the 108. So, but what was interesting here is if your, poly, if your neuropathy is not due to diabetes or it's, there is a secondary cause like inflammation, um, you get an additional RAF score. So that's why it's always good to be very specific, put in every diagnosis, and make it as specific as possible. As you see, they get the demographic risk factor here, 0.379, and the total of 2.36 is the addition of 1.461 for gangrene, the diabetes code, and of course, the code for uh, the inflammatory polyneuropathy. Again, some more examples of diabetes. If I told you about the, the 0.3 diagnosis, well, the 0.6 diagnosis uh, with diabetic arthropathy and other complications, foot, skin, and mouth, they also require three digits. So if you put in this diagnosis, diabetes with diabetic arthropathy, which a lot of your EMRs will do, and you only go to two digits, you're going to get no RAF. You've got to go to three digits. And as you see here, it go, go to three digits. 610 is diabetes with di uh, with diabetic arthropathy, and it's the third digit. It's the same diagnosis, essentially, but now the third digit, you get the 0.318. Of course, you're only going to get credit for one of these, so the arthropathy, the dermatitis, all these other ones are going to cancel out. However, there's another code here, 0.621, E11.621, is when you have a foot ulcer. Foot ulcer code rafts to both the 18 and the category 161. So you get not only the 0 0.318, but you get the 0 0.5315. So even though you put multiple diabetes codes here and all these 0.318s canceled out, you still get credit for this 0 0.315. So that's why you always want to code as many diabetic complications as you can so that you, you get some of these codes that wrap into two or three uh, categories. Um, and again, showing you down here, if you only went to two digits rather than three digits, you get no RAF, and of course, the diabetes without complications gets X'd out. So what do we have with the RAF score? Well, the average RAF is one. The national average for non-Medicare Advantage, it depends on regions, probably around $9,000. For Medicare Advantage, it's all going to be dependent on the region, and it could be as low as $7,000 for that RAF score of one um, in some area, or it could be higher. It just depends. So I'm just using this 9,000 as a non-MA. Uh, estimate to show you some uh, values of what's assigned to the care of that patient. So CMB re uh, CMS reimburses 1% higher for every 0.01 RAF. That means you get about $900 for every 0.1 RAF increase. So the diagnosis coding drives the RAF score, the RAF score drives the reimbursement, and proper documentation retains the reimbursement. It's important to understand this because this is going to happen over the next two years. In the past, all these risk scores were determined by this risk adjustment processing center, which gathered all this information from all these payers and all over. Now, they're moving towards taking the diagnosis straight from the fee-for-service and counter forms. So, in 17, it was 2575. This year, it's 5050. Next year, it's 7525. And then in 2020, it's going to be 100% encounter data, where, as in 2016, it was only 15%. So we've moved rather quickly to the encounters, and this is why you have to make sure you have the right diagnosis on your encounters. The normalization factor, like I say, this is applied every year to make sure that the average risk score is one. If it's like it is for 2018, just slightly over one, that means the risk scores are adjusted up just a, just a hair to make everybody at one this year. And then there's an MA coding pattern adjustment. This is applied to adjust for the difference in coding patterns. MA plans depend on coding, so they are more aggressive at coding and getting the codes than the traditional Medicare patients, which uh, most of the providers that see them aren't under the same guidelines or, or there isn't anybody overlooking uh, their coding. So you'll see about a 5.6% uh, deficit uh, for, for their risk scores, meaning they basically only get 94% of their risk scores compared to what... Uh, the uh, uh, non-MA plans, the traditional Medicare get, because the coding is so much more aggressive. There's so much better coding that uh, uh, to, to equalize the codes, they have to do that. So there's three points that you have to remember when you document. The diagnosis through a face-to-face -face visit, 
the status or condition, stable conditioning, worsening, labs or tests ordered, medications adjusted, and then a plan of action. COPD stable, continue current medications. You have to have all three of these. Why are documentation and specificity important? We'll look at an example. Hepatitis C, unspecified, no RAF. Hepatitis C, acute, no RAF, because you haven't mentioned any kind of treatment or, or whatever, usually when you uh, use that diagnosis. Chronic hepatitis, though, implies that there's some ongoing surveillance, there's some ongoing tra uh, treatment, and now your RAF score is 0.165 because you've uh, hit a category HCC 29. Almost every RAF lecture you go to talks about the meat, and the meat is monitor. You want to look at the signs and symptoms, evaluate the test results, medication effectiveness, response to treatment. You want to assess and address, ordering test, discussion, review, record, counsel. You want to treat medications, therapies, and other modalities. You have to have the meat. Now, it's kind of corny, but this is the one the thing that I tell people is without the meat, CMS can find you guilty of deceit, and this can land you in their hot seat. But the reality is there are audits on these charts. You have to make sure you're doing this appropriately and not uh, coding without the appropriate, uh, appropriate documentation. So your progress notes, you must evaluate each diagnosis on the progress note. It has to be face-to-face. And you cannot refer to a problem list as documentation. So you want to use diabetes with neuropathy, stable meds adjusted, COPD, PFT ordered, refer to pulmonary, hypertension uncontrolled, add medication. These are perfect examples. Diagnosis is listed on the progress note without an evaluation or assessment is considered a problem list. It does not provide the correct documentation. So the other thing it doesn't is probable, suspected, and possible. Do not code non-definitive conditions. Probable, possible, questionable, rule out, they don't code, they don't RAF, you can't use them. Code the condition always to the highest degree of specificity. Sign symptoms, abnormal tests, other reason for the visit. Always do the highest degree of specificity. So, history of indicates the condition no longer exists. Pay special attention to list or such as uh, past medical history. You don't want to refer to that. So instead of documenting history of diabetes, you want to say patient with diabetes since 2009. History of CH, medicines, Lasix, you want to say compensated CHF, stable on Lasix. History of COPD, meds, Advair, controlled COPD with Advair. If it's not documented in the medical record, then it did not happen. So the other uh, linkage type verbiage that CMS looks for is due to, because of, related to. Those are all acceptable. What's not acceptable is the word with, except diabetes with retinopathy, diabetes with renal manifestations, diabetes with neuropathy. That is acceptable. Every year, like we said, things reset. You have to remember the things that are ongoing. You know, they transplant. If they had a transplant, you want to mention that because they didn't have to have a transplant this year to qualify. That transplants for life. Quadriplegia, same thing. Dialysis status if they have an ostomy, an amputation, even an HIV infection. People forget that. You know, they may be asymptomatic, their titers are negative, uh, but you have to mention that. And you have to document it, and you have to document a treatment. So we talked about the medical RAF. There's also a prescription RAF. And this is mainly for Part D. Um, it's for Medicare Advantage, not really MSSP. But you will see that each patient, no matter what their diagnosis are, gets a baseline RAF. And that RAF decreases with age because our 90-year-olds, of course, are usually our more healthy people that have uh, limited, uh, limited medications uh, if they've made it that long. So, and here you can see that each one of these categories will now have a, a numerical RAF assigned to it. So for an HIV with AIDS patient, they're going to get 2.93 in RX RAF. A lot of codes, medical codes, have zero RAF scores, meaning there's no medical RAF for them. However, they all, a lot of them have uh, RX, HCC, uh, RAFN. So, some examples, hypothyroid, panic disorder, hypercholesterol, general anxiety, migraine, glaucoma. All of these have zero RAF scores for medical, but they all have positive RX RAF scores. Same thing with ischemic cardiomyopathy, stenosis, carotids, CVAs, asthma, GERD, osteoporosis, coronaries. All of these, again, have zero RAF scores for medical, but they have RX, HCC, RAF scores, so you definitely want to make sure you code them. 
And here's some examples of those, uh, chronic hepatitis 3.2, COPD 0.33, diabetic retinopathy 0.30. All of these are the RX RAF scores associated with those categories, CHF 0.166. Disease interactions, you don't have to code this. This happens automatically behind the scene, but it's important to understand what these interactions are because you get additional RAF scores. So for congestive heart failure, you get a RAF score of 0.323, category 85. For diabetes with complications like eyes, renal, uh, neuropathy, something like that, you get uh, a RAF of 0.318 in category 18. But if you have the patient that has both of these, uh, your RAF score before the interaction would be 0.641. But because they have this interaction RAF of CHF and diabetes, you get an additional 0.154. So now your total RAF score is 0.795. CHF is kind of your wild card here. It, it wraps uh, disease interactions with a lot of different things. Diabetes, COPD, certain heart arrhythmias, which we'll show, renal disease failure. Of course, COPD does wrap with cardiorespiratory failure, and then uh, you get an additional 0.336. And then cancers and some disorders of immunity, like this SCID and PNP uh, deficiency. You know, those things uh, uh, with cancer will give you an additional wrap as well. But I'd like to start out on the medical aspect of this by focusing on diabetes. Um, of course, these are your codes, diabetes due to underlying condition, EO8, drug and chemical, EO9, type 1, 10, type 2, E11, so, uh, secondary diabetes, E13. And I put this on there just to show you. Z79.4, which most Z codes don't wrap, this one actually wraps. All it is, it says the patient uses insulin, and it wraps to diabetes without complications, uh, 0.104 wrap score. So, quality documentation in diabetes, you got to differentiate type 1 or type 2. Is there a manifestation or complications? If it does have a manifestation in the system, you have to state it, you have to document it, you have to say it's due to diabetes. And you should comment on controlled or uncontrolled. So, every patient should be evaluated for these manifestations. So, E11 again with survival complications, that's the RAF at uh, HCC 19. And then all of these others are in the 18. Uh, category, the kidneys, eyes, neurologic, circulatory, oral, all of those give you a 0.32 or 318. Now, complications of diabetes, like I say, are the most frequently admitted conditions in these physician medical records. This is kind of my wheel of diabetes unfortunate, uh, misfortune, as just about every organ system in the body is impacted by diabetes, the kidneys, the feet, the, the eyes, um, you name it. And so these complications need to be documented. You need to say due to in the chart. And if you don't, if the medical records only says diabetes and there's no due to or linking these two, then you have to use a E11.9. You only get a RAF of 0.104 for that. Now, this is something I found that a lot of people don't understand, and it's very important. There's codes that won't RAF. Everybody thinks a diabetes code is going to RAF no matter what. It has to be specific. So the E11, the 0.3 codes, the, the I codes, have to be four digits. The only exceptions are if you did unspecified, which is 0.311 or 0.319. But remember what I showed you, a lot of these codes wrap to multiple uh, HCC categories. So you don't really want to use unspecified because you could be missing out on those uh, secondary uh, and tertiary uh, uh, RAF uh, categories. So an example here, E11.321, type 2 diabetes, mild nonproliferative diabetic retinopathy with macular edema, sounds fairly specific, except you get no RAF because you have to say which eye it's in. Right eye, left eye, both eyes. You have to use that fourth digit. Same thing down here with diabetes with other complications. There's the hypoglycemia, neuropathy, skin, oral. If you use two digits, you're not going to RAF. You have to use three digits when you use the 0.6 uh, diagnosis codes. Retinopathy, you have to differentiate. Proliferative, non-proliferative versus unspecified, and then with or without macular edema. You want to carry every patient that has eye complications out to that. Do they have retinopathy? Do they not? Do they have macular edema? Do they not? And here's why. You can use the unspecified, the 311. Remember I said there's two codes that don't require the fourth digit? Well, these are the two. You're going to get the RAF there, but uh, specifically for the one with macular edema, you're not going to get that secondary RAF code. So you want to take these to a fourth digit. Again, if you move it to the E11321 and only use three digits for the non-proliferative with macular edema, you get zero RAF. You get no, no credit for taking care of that patient whatsoever. On the other hand, 
if you do the uh, E113212 with uh, the non-proliferative with macular edema, now you get a RAF of uh, uh, 0.318 because you mentioned it's in their left eye. Now, proliferative, of course, that's going to give you that secondary RAF code uh, in the category 122 for 0.217. Again, if you only use three divots, digits, you're not going to get the credit for it. You have to specify the eye, so you want to use the E11.3511, which is the proliferative with macular edema, right eye. Now you get both of those codes. And again, the same thing if you didn't have macular edema, the secondary HCC-122 code is based on proliferative diabetic. So again, you don't want to use the three digits, you want to use the four digits. And you know that 0.525 there is worth about five six thousand dollars in treatment dollars. Let's do a coding scenario real quick. Type two diabetic is seen for severe full thickness left pressure ulcer uh, into the muscle. Patient's history clarifies it's due to diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Hemoglobin 9.6, not very good to control. Physician uh, our physical shows uh, very weak pedal pulses and purple cold toes. So we got some peripheral vascular disease. So how are we going to code this? We're going to code the diabetes with peripheral vascular disease. We're going to code the diabetic neuropathy. We're going to include diabetic-induced pressure ulcer. And this goes into the muscle full thickness. This can be a stage four ulcer. Now, in case you forget how to stage the ulcers, it's very critical, and I'm going to show you in a second, because there's a huge difference between one and two, which get no RAF score, three, which does get a RAF score, and then four, which gets double that RAF score. So you definitely want to make sure any ulcer you have, you grade that the pressure ulcer into the stages. So again, we're going to take this patient, we're going to put all these diagnoses into their, into their record and see what comes out and how, how the RAF score is determined. Uh, the most specific one here is probably the one that uses uh, the diabetes with the peripheral uh, vascular disease without gangrene. As you see, this is another one of these diabetes codes that RAFs to two scores with one code. You get the 0.298 for 108 and you get the 0.318. We also could use the diabetes with foot ulcer. However, in our category of HCC, 108 trumps 161. Um, and for that reason, you only get a 0.298 rather than a 0.535. And there's a reason for that. It's because of this ulcer down here that's coding. 157, uh, of course, is, uh, trumps the 158 because the stage four is worse. Getting this credit for this 0 0.21, uh, 0 0.63 eliminates eliminates the 161. So basically, if you get credit for 157 or 158, you're going to eliminate the 161, which is what happened here. However, if you documented that pressure sore is only stage one or stage two, then you would actually get credit for this 161. You would not have a 158 or 157. That's why you want to put all the codes you can in here that apply. Again, I put these codes in just to three and stage four, and then I also put the code in, you could use none, if you didn't feel it was a pressure uh, ulcer, you could use chronic ulcer of the skin, which gives you that same category 161.535, but again, because we're getting credit for a 157 or 158, we're not gonna get credit for a 161. You need to be specific. So let's go over this, the diabetic with the diabetic retinopathy. We've got systolic, congestive heart failure. That's pretty specific, 150.2. However, you get a RAF for zero. 150.9, which is unspecified, you would have actually got RAF. It's one of the few times where you could use an unspecified again and get high, higher RAF, but I'll show you why that's important. Diabetic with chronic complications, you only went out to three digits, but it's a pretty specific diagnosis. Again, you got a RAF of zero. So now you've got a RAF score of zero in patients that have a, a potential of about a 0 0.6, 0 0.7 RAF score. You get no disease interaction either. So you basically lost about 0.8 in RAF or about $8,000 uh, that it's applied to your pool of taking care of these patients. So as we said, if we're not specific, we only go to three digits. You also can code macular edema. If that patient, this patient has macular edema, you want to code macular edema. But again, if you only go to three digits, this time, the interesting thing is with macular edema, the I is already the third digit. The fourth digit, though, is whether it's proliferative or non-proliferative. So they give you no credit if you don't include that four digit, fourth digit. And systolic congestive heart failure, like you said, uh, like we said, has to be more specific. Is it acute, chronic, or compensated? And then obesity. This gentleman was uh, 440 BMI. Does not give you any RAF. This is why you always record the Z code for the BMI on every patient you see. So 
our total wrap was zero. However, if we would have coded the fourth digit there and put the right eye, now we're getting a RAF of 0.318 for the diabetes and we're getting a 0.217 for the proliferative retinopathy. If we go out to the fourth digit and say with active neovascularization on the uh, macular degeneration, we get an additional 0.5, which again is about uh, $4,500. Chronic congestive heart failure systolic, 150.22, just adding the digit gets us that RAF and gets us that interaction. Putting the right Z code in for the BMI gets us an additional RAF. So this patient on the left side had a RAF of zero, even though it's fairly specific. And on the right side, the RAF score was 1.752, which is approximately $15,000 in cost that was uh, not attributed to your patients. Chronic kidney disease is next. Stage one, stage two, stage three. Do not RAF, but you still want to include them. And uh, I'll show you an example of why. Stage four does. N18.4 with a GFR of 15 to 29, and then stage five with kidney failure or uh, end stage renal disease. All of those RAF. Microalbuminuria and proteinuria. If it's due to diabetes, code it in the chart because, um, say, the proteinuria and microalbuminuria is documented in the chart secondary to diabetes, you have a diabetic without any other complications. However, now they have microalbuminuria. Now you can say that this is chronic kidney disease stage one or stage two, uh, secondary to diabetes type two. And now you can use the 11.22 code, and now you've tripled your RAF score in that patient. You've gone to ACC 18 from ACC 19, which was 0.1. So anytime you have protein or, or microalbuminuria, you can say it's secondary to diabetes, that you say can be secondary to diabetes, you can get the, the diabetes uh, with uh, chronic kidney disease code. Cardiology, always be specific. Don't use things like coronary artery disease, atherosclerotic heart disease. You always want to use the more specific diagnosis, and angina is the key one. Treated or untreated, you want to document it. It remains active. If you give a patient beta blockers, some, some other medicine to control their angina, and they don't have symptoms, that doesn't mean it's not active. As long as you are prescribing something for that angina, it is angina. Now, if it's angina that's resolved after you've done PTCA and cabbage and you don't have to give them any pharmacological treatment, then it's not active. Acute versus old MIs. The, the acute MI is only the first four weeks. So if you don't see them within the first four weeks, it becomes an old MI and that does not RAF. But if the angina persists or they're treating angina, then you use that I-20.9 code and you do get a RAF. So acute becomes old after about four weeks. So again, back if we're treating, the angina, if it's asymptomatic, it's a pharmacological treatment, you still code it and you use the 120.9 or one of the anginal codes, 0.140. I'll show you in a second, if it's unstable angina, you want to use that code because that gives you almost double the RAF score. You don't use something like chronic ischemic heart disease. Uh, chronic conditions such as arrhythmias, they can be symptomatic and of course you're going to be coding those. It's the asymptomatic ones that you're treating with medicines uh, or interventional cardiology that you want to still code. As long as that uh, arrhythmia is being treated in some fashion, you want to code it, whether they have symptoms or not. As I showed you, congestive heart failure is your critical one for your disease interaction. It is always a chronic diagnosis, even if it's stable. So you always want to code CHF and you always want to be specific. Remember, don't use that one digit. Use two digits um, on all the codes uh, because you won't get scores, you won't get credit if you only use one digit, except if you use the I-50.9, which is nonspecific, uh, but you usually want to be more specific in, in systolic, diastolic, or some other pulmonary hypertension code. So these are the codes for di uh, for uh, CHF. Again, the nonspecific one does give you a code, uh, a RAF of uh, 0.323, the 150.9. The 150s, though, the 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, no RAF. You have to go to that second digit. So as you can see, the 2-3 is the chronic systolic, the 3-0 is the diastolic, and then you've got left heart failure at 150.1. That does code uh, as well. Um, and then the pulmonary hypertension, I-27.0, that codes as a CHF code. So that will give you the interaction codes with diabetes, COPT, and the other ones. Arrhythmias. Remember, once an arrhythmia, always an arrhythmia unless you permanently corrected it without going pharmacological mechanism intervention. So Unless you can permanently say it's gone away, it's always coded as an active diagnosis. And again, all of these diagnoses is RAF, um, but remember we talked about the interaction with CHF. 
all of these diagnoses, AFib, a flutter, sock, sick sinus, PV, uh, uh, paroxysmal ventricular attack, cardioventricular, fever, all of those would RAF and interact with the CHF and give you that 0.105. However, if you just code them as PVCs, palpitations, tachycardia, bradycardia, dysarrhythmia, it's not going to RAF with the CHF. So be very specific with your arrhythmias. Vascular, your aneurysms are going to code. Your atherosclerotic disease without angina is not specific. It does not code. On CT scans or chest x-rays, you may see some atherosclerosis or calcifications in the aorta. You code that. I70.0, that's 0.298 RAF. You do not code the, or you can code the atherosclerotic renal artery, but you won't get any RAF. And atherosclerosis of the extremities, again, gets you RAF if you go out and be specific to that third digit, not just the first digit or the second digit. You have to go to the third digit. And peripheral vascular disease, same thing, 173.9. You can get credit for that. So these just show you some conditions that don't code, and they do risk adjust, the hypertensive heart disease, the angina unspecified, the atherosclerosis. Again, the unstable angina, I20.0, that gives you a RAF score double the angina unspecified, and then the AFib. Pulmonary, they all RAF to the same score, and it doesn't matter which one of these you code, COPD, emphysema, I mean, I'm sorry, obstructive chronic bronchitis, um, a chronic obstructive asthma, simple chronic bronchitis, they're all going to code, even the J42 without specificity, there's going to code to a uh, HCC weight. So major depression, a lot of your EMRs default to F32.9 or 38. Those are nonspecific depression. They don't give you any risk factor at all. So you want to be as specific as you can with these mood disturbances, mania, depression, um, you know, bipolar, whatever. You want to be as specific as you can with the mental uh, disorder and the final diagnosis. If you don't put a descriptor in, major or recurrent, then you have to use that F329, which is no HCC weight. So you always want to use major or recurrent. Major depressive order disorder, simple uh, single episode. F32.0, you get credit for that. The recurrent episode 33, you get credit for that, or credit for that. The major depressive disorder and remission, you get credit for that. So whether it's into remission, it's recurrent or single, you're going to get credit. You're bipolar, you're going to get the same credit. Of course, you're more advanced psychological illness like schizophrenia, you're going to get a higher RAF score. So this goes to show you again, if you put all of these diagnoses in one patient, mild, moderate, single episode with psychotic features, single episode of remission, full remission. Whatever the code F32.0 through F32.5, you are going to get 0.395 RAF score. You are going to get nothing if you don't put mild, severe, or, or, or uh, use one of those codes uh, if you use F32.8 or F32.9. We always overlook this, but alcoholic dependence or alcoholism, you have a history of alcoholism, you always have a history of alcoholism. It can be coded F10.20.383. Drug dependence, same thing, opioid uh, benzodiazepine dependence. Now that's become a big uh, factor as we go forward. Um, of course, the opioid dependence uh, gives you a 0.383 as well in the benzos. So any one of these dependencies is going to give you a 0.383. Again, you can read this. I'll put the slides out later, but th this just tells you the people you want to screen for and code with alcohol dependence and things that, especially if you have two to three of the criteria, four to five. Opioid dependence. A lot of us use the code Z79 for um, uh, long-term treatment. You get no RAF for that. Dependence, though. Anybody has tolerance, withdrawal, they increase usage, they have a desire or effort to cut down on use, they spend a lot of time trying to get the drugs. <coughs> Excuse me. Those people are opioid dependent, and you want to use the 11.2 code. You do not want to use alcohol dependence, unspecified, opioid, uncomplicated, or unspecified. You get no RAF for any of that. Malnutrition, very much over, overlooked. But any of your cancer patients, your chronic alcohol, liver disease, even your CHF, COPD, renal disease, celiac, cystic fibrosis, demented patients, you want to look for malnutrition. Um, the malnutrition codes start for forward.x, and as you can see here, uh, even unspecified malnutrition, which is a weight loss of 5% in three months or 10% in six months, or a BMI uh, less than 17.9, you can use these codes. So any BMI less than 17.9, you want to use one of these malnutrition codes. Morbid obesity, as I said, definitely RAFs. Anybody over BMI of 40, you always want to try and use the specific Z codes if you can, but you can use the E66.01, which is the morbid obesity code. Uh, when you have comorbid conditions, uh, you can use the uh, morbid obesity greater than 35 because you have to link it to the condition, though. 
arthritis, sleep apnea, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. If, if you link it to that condition, then you will get some RAF score for that. Remember, when you code a stroke, it's an acute event. Unless it happened in front of you, it didn't happen as a stroke. You have to code it as history of a stroke. So what you do get the RAF for is if they have any side effects or late effects from the, uh, from the stroke, like can't swallow, speaking, uh, hemiplegia, of course, uh, any of those are going to get you a RAF score, but you have to use the late effect codes. Always code seizures and epilepsy every year, even if they're on medicine having had a seizure in 20 years. As long as they're being treated, they have to be coded and documented, and uh, you can use the code. Parkinson's, same thing. Uh, even if they're under control and they're on medication, you want to code it. You do not get credit for Alzheimer's, Lewy body, or other dementias. However, you do get RAF scores in the RX RAF category so the, for the prescription, so you want to do that. Multiple sclerosis, you uh, get a 0.441. Oncology, this is a little bit uh, tricky, but uh, malignancies are only coded until the patient has completed definitive treatment. So what's definitive treatment? That means surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation therapy aimed at eradicating the malignancy. So patients that don't receive definitive treatment, they'll be treated uh, positively or sent to hospice, those patients continue to have, even if you're not treating them, that patient's still considered active cancer at that point if they haven't received definitive treatment. Patients on adjuvant therapy for breast, prostate, examples of the taxines, the aromatase inhibitors, doxotrol, they are coded as they have active disease. So definitely make sure you code them as active. Surveillance, patients who have completed therapy can only be coded as a personal history. That includes these patients undergoing surveillance. They can't be coded as active. Metastatic disease, as we said, it doesn't matter where it goes, bone, uh, liver, lung, ovary, wherever, I mean, wherever it's going, it's still coded as metastatic disease. There's a separate ICD-10 category for that. Uh, you want to code them as secondary malignant neoplasms. And these are the codes for, for cancer. And again, just to show you, if you had an unfortunate patient here that have to, had 10 different types of cancers, remember we have our hierarchy. Nine is going to take precedence over 10. It's going to take precedence over 11 or 12. So the lung cancer or the esophageal cancer is going to take precedence over any of these, ovary, colon, brain, pelvis, uh, melanoma. Any of these other ones are all going to be eliminated. You're only going to get credit for one of the cancers. Same thing when you put in the secondary malignant. doesn't matter where it goes, brain, bone, lung. Whatever, you're going to get 0.2 or 2.625, and the uh, other ones are going to be overridden no matter how many types of cancer. They're all going to be overridden. So just as an example here, breast cancer, um, which is ACC12, again, uh, ICD10, 50.510, uh, RAF.1416. If it's spread to the lymph nodes, you get rid of the 50.510. Uh, you get rid of that ICD9. Now you make it, uh, or ICD10, rather, you make it... Uh, C77.8, which is the spread of cancer to lymph nodes, very nonspecific. It doesn't have to say breast cancer. It doesn't have to say any type of cancer. It just says spread of cancer to lymph nodes. Now you get a RAF of 2.625. As I told you, specificity matters. But as you can see, a couple of these secondary cancers, the ones that are metastasized, the malnutrition, cirrhosis, some of the chronic hepatitis, uh, which we showed you after you code that, you get the RAF, rheumatoid arthritis, schizophrenia, emphysema, COPD, AFib, aflutter. It doesn't have to be specific. All you got to do is use the code, and you will get credit for it. But like we showed you in diabetes, angina, renal failure, uh, pressure ulcers, you have to code them to the most specific, or you will not get credit. This goes to show you how the MA plans are being paid. So if you put no diagnosis in for this patient that's still eligible, all he's going to get is his demographics, 0.492, and the plan is going to receive 418 or $5,000, and that's what, for you taking care of that patient, that's what your care is going to be attributed to. Have you treated him for less than $5,000 for all his ailments for the year, when if you would have put in just diabetes without complications, you would at least got a 0.104 and you would have raised that up to uh, about $1,000. However, this patient had pressure ulcer or had a skin ulcer, I'm sorry, and congestive heart failure. So if you had coded that, you would have actually got an additional uh, almost $12,000 by just putting those two more specific codes in, uh, you would have uh, had $12,000 more to treat this patient for the year. Uh, just something from a medical record. Again, you've got a 66-year-old annual wellness, history of diabetes, neuropathy, depression, major depression. You know, it's got, you've got congestive heart failure, tra traumatic toe amputation, um, and the exam is documented there with the toe uh, amputation. Uh, diagnosis and plan, diabetes is stable, 
current treatment, uh, neuropathy stable, current treatment. That's all you have to do, major depression. So if you coded this nonspecifically, diabetes uncomplicated, you're only going to get the 0.014. If you just did a neuropathy code and didn't say it was secondary diabetes, you're going to get nothing. Major depression, you didn't use one of the more specific codes, you get nothing. Obesity, again, you didn't use the BMI, you get nothing. The toe amputation, you did. So if we're more specific, we use the neuropathy with diabetes. Now we get three times the RAF score for diabetes. We get the morbid obesity at 0.365. We now have documented this is major depression, which it said that in the chart, and you get the 0.33. And then the congestive heart failure, which is always a diagnosis. You get the 0.368. And of course, the toe amputation and the CHF and DM interaction. Now your risk score just went up by 1.5, which is about $12,000. Uh, that you left uh, out there that uh, could have been attributed to the patients you were treating. Just a couple examples to finish up here. Um, again, I'm going to put all these codes in one patient. This is just to show you that basically this patient has 10 codes, but nine of them raft to different categories that didn't overlap. So they actually got nine, they actually got nine risk scores. The only ones that overlapped, of course, were the diabetes because they were both in 18, the eye complications and the kidney complications. Everything else went into a different uh, RAF category. And to make this even more apparent with the interactions, I've color-coded this, but since we have a congestive heart failure diagnosis, which is pulmonary hypertension, and also a diabetes, we got that additional interaction. Since we had a CHF and a COPD, we got that interaction, 0.19. We had a CHF and a renal group, we've got that 0.27. And then we had a CHF with a arrhythmia, chronic AFib. So we got all four of those interactions. We don't have to code it, it's automatically done for you, but that raised our RAF score there to 4.1 or 4.126. Now, let's look at a little bit different patient. We changed that secondary uh, category from eyes to, to a foot ulcer. Again, remember, we don't have, in that first example I showed you, we had gangrene, it overrode, it had category 158 or 157, overrode the 161. Well, you don't have that in this uh, situation. So. You don't have to include, remember the non-pressure ulcer was worth 0.535. This is obviously, uh, we didn't tell you this, but the ulcer is not stage one or stage two. So again, no, no RAF there. So just including that E11.621 got you that additional RAF score in 161. And then all the other scores still RAF and all the interactions still stay. Now, if you were to remove that diabetes with foot ulcer, and again, like I said, put in that non-pressure ulcer, you're gonna get the exact same RAF score. But if I was gonna tell you to do something, you wanna include all of these codes. You wanna include the L97.509, and you wanna include the diabetes with foot ulcer. You wanna put them all in and let the system knock out what it needs to. You wanna be as specific as possible and include all the codes. And you still had all the interactions here. And again, just to show you what happens when you put gangrene in, now you go to that category 106. Well, that's gonna overrule your 108. It's gonna overrule your one, even your uh, left below knee amputation. But You've removed uh, approximately 0.9, but you've got 1.461 by getting the gangrene. And again, remember, there's a diabetes code with gangrene. You could have included, you would have still got this 1461, and you would also got the 0.318. So um, I didn't show it here, but you could have you could have put both of those in, but you're still only going to get credit for the 1.461. So if you want to go practice risk scores, they have a calculator online. Um, at this point. Uh, if there's any specific questions, I'll answer them. Um, otherwise, um, uh, I hope you all have a good night, and thank you.